Hello and welcome to Trauma Solve, where we offer inspiration and hope to anybody recovering from trauma and abuse. Today's interview is with a really courageous woman called Carolyn Bramall. I came across Car Carolyn through her book, which is available on Amazon, Am I a Good Girl Yet? It documents Carolyn's journey from an extremely traumatic childhood, which resulted in her developing DID or Dissociative Identity Disorder, which used to be known as Multiple Personality Disorder. Um, but she went on to heal that as an adult with the help of a very good therapist and with the support of the church group that she belonged to at the time, who were very loving and, and helpful to her on her healing journey. Carolyn went on to write several books. Her most recent book is called Intelligent Loving, and it's all about how to love somebody who's gone through trauma. She also set up an organisation called Heart for Truth, Heart for Truth is a Christian-based organisation and it's international. And what they do is they go to churches and they educate the people at the churches in how to help and to deal with people who've gone through the kind of trauma Carolyn went through and how to support them on their healing journeys. So Carolyn's done a lot of work. She's a real inspiration. And I hope that anybody out there who's struggling with their healing journey can take heart from from Carolyn's, uh, from Carolyn's journey. Hi Carolyn, thanks for agreeing to talk Hello, to us. Hello Maria, nice to be here. Um, could you start by giving us some background, a little bit about your early life? Ah, well my early life was actually really quite ordinary. In fact, I was brought up in a little, little village in Surrey. My family seemed to people the village there was a big family. Granny had nine children. Granny and Grandad lived in our house. In fact, we lived in their house, to be honest. My mum and dad and my sister and I, we brought up, we went to the, the uh, village school. We loved the countryside. We, we just went to the village um, uh, church. It was all just quite idyllic, actually. I played in the fields. Yeah, I was in the brownies and my went to ballet classes, yeah. So as a little girl, everything appeared on the outside to be absolutely hunky-dory. OK, so, so it looked like that you, you'd had this idyllic childhood, really? It looked like it, yes. Yeah. So at what point did you start to realise that everything wasn't as it seemed? Well, that was a, that's a difficult question in that I always felt that I was different from the other children. And... I often was taken home from school because I cried a lot. I was very tired and um, things bothered me. Uh, I was quite a sensitive little girl. Uh, I w when I was in my early teens, I, I it got quite lonely. I kind of felt I wasn't like my friends and I didn't really know why. And then when I was on my 16th birthday, I had this deep sense that I was a bad person. And I, on my 16th birthday, I got my mum's bread knife and cut my arm um, before going to the vicar's wife's open day and doing the washing up for her while she served tea in the garden. And I remember my hands in the sink really stinging, but I didn't want to go outside because somebody would ask me, why my hands were bleeding and it's because I'd cut I'd cut them because I thought I was a bad person. So so was that the first sort of indicator for you that that, that something wasn't wasn't right? That something mm, was... I, I mean I, I think when you're little you only live in your own head, don't you? Yeah. I didn't know what other people felt about their lives. I only knew what I felt about my life. And I used to try really hard to copy other children to sort of behave like them, because it felt like I wasn't quite doing it right. Right, so there was a sense that something was amiss there. But yes. A sort of, was it a vague kind of feeling, it was all, confusing? It was all very vague. And, of yeah. course, you know, the sense of self-awareness only comes when you're much older than that. So, um, and yes, until I was 
I was a teenager. I, at 14, I became a Christian. I gave my life to Jesus when I was in the middle of a field. And I just knew that there needs to be somebody bigger than me because something is wrong. And um, I went into this field um, early one morning on Valentine's Day. And it was first thing in the morning and the cow pups in the field were sparkling with the, with the frost. And I, I stood in the field and I looked up to the sky and I said, God, I know about you. Do you know about me? And it was really important that he, somebody really, really big and powerful, knew something of what was happening for me. But I was not aware at the time of what was happening in, in the night at that point. Okay. I had forgotten it all. Okay, so you had these amnesic barriers. Huge yeah. barriers, yes. So you were functioning in the daytime, albeit struggling a bit, mm -hmm. but you, you, didn't, you didn't know what was, you had no idea at the time what was happening to you at night time. No idea at all. In fact, I didn't actually find out what was going on till I was in my 30s. And I was married, I had two children, we had gone to America to work um, as Christian workers. We opened a home for abused women. And it was there that there were some triggers that, um, by triggers I mean things that just reminded me of something. And I saw, because we were working with abuse survivors and crisis pregnancy situations, I was shown a video of an abortion. And immediately, bam, 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 my, my, my senses became alive and I was overwhelmed with all kinds of feelings and I collapsed and I was sent to hospital and they asked me questions I couldn't answer. And then only then when I had a trained therapist called Christopher, uh, you'll hear it, read about him in my book, that he started to probe and then I realised something very bad and very, very overwhelming and quite evil had happened in my life. Then it started to leak out the reality of what, what, was, what had gone on. Okay, so until that point, you had no idea that you had alter personalities? Not a clue, no. Um, I, knew, I knew increasingly that something was really weird about me because when um, my husband and I, we, we, we had two small children, we were working full time for churches in, in Bradford. Um, and even though I was working with the most lovely Christian people, I felt that I was evil. I felt dirty. And occasionally I felt I shouldn't be with these people because I'm, I'm going to taint them. I'm going to spoil, I'm going to make their purity and their loveliness, I'm going to make it bad. And I wondered if perhaps I should not be doing what I'm doing. I also had night terrors and I wasn't asleep, I was awake, but I used to see things, you call them hallucinations if you like, I don't know what they were, um, but it was terrifying. And I also heard voices in my head and one voice kept crying, a little child kept crying, crying and crying and crying. And she, she, she'd say, no more, no more, no more, please, no more, on and on and on. And the crying used to be really irritating. And another voice would tell me I was doing it all wrong, whatever I did, whether I was hoovering the floor or looking after the children or doing something in church, it was always wrong. And I, I didn't know that everybody didn't yeah. have those voices. Because that was your experience and that was the only experience you'd life. ever had. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. So Christopher, was it Christopher that sort of said to you actually that's not everybody does here have that? Well, one day when I was, I'd left hospital, I'd been there seven weeks and I left hospital and saw this, um, 
uh, lovely man, Dr. Christopher Rostick, and, and he was asking me awkward questions. And one day he said to me, um, have you ever been photographed and when you didn't want to be? And suddenly, everything, kind of all my thoughts went crazy. And my, is it almost like all the words went up in the sky. And, and I thought, I don't want to answer that. And um, it was really scary. And I made a run for the door. And he stopped me going out and sat me down again. And he said, what can you see? And I described the man that I could see. And that's when I started realizing, just a minute, that man I can see. He was doing things that I didn't want him to do. And then we began to think that something had been going on at long term that is beyond, is off the scale in terms of badness, I suppose. Had Christopher come across satanic ritual abuse? Had he come across that at that point in his career? No, nope. he didn't know what satanic ritual abuse was. He didn't know what DID was. Right. He worked very hard to find out. He hadn't, you know, he he hadn't met somebody else who did what I did, and of course he would say something, and suddenly I was not a thirty-three-year-old woman sitting there. I was a little child who was very frightened and didn't know what to do or was very anxious or fidgety or angry. And so he had to find out, just a minute, this, this, this is a little bit strange. Um, I know this woman as a fairly reasonable, intelligent individual, mm. and yet here she is doing very unreasonable things. And so he found out a lot more and he went to some length to find out. Um, and when he just told me that he thinks I might have what was then called multiple personality disorder, I got very cross and stormed out, ran away. He had to come and run after me. I said, don't be so silly. And it was a load of rot. Um, but I was, I was objecting too much, really. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, so, so during the therapy with Christopher, is that when, was it then that the altar started to come out more? Um, previous to that, were they sort of more internal? Was it, the, was it the working with the therapist that actually brought them out? Yes. In the open? Yes, there are two things that make an altar switch and, and, and become out. One is when somebody feels really safe. And I began to feel very safe with him. I knew I could tell him anything. And he wasn't going to tell anyone else, because of course everything is so secret when you're an abused mm. child. Mm. Everything is secret, you mustn't let on anything because bad things will happen, you are told, if, if you tell the secrets. Um, and I realized I could tell him anything and he would accept me and receive what I said. He wouldn't doubt it. Uh, he wouldn't tell anyone. And he was very kind and very gentle. So I felt safe. And so when you feel safe, you realize that you can, you can start to let go of this big burden because each altar is created to hold a memory or an overwhelming emo in emotion. So they, they're, they're, there's always a reason why you have another part, always. And it's something specific. And so, when you've let go of your memory, the burden goes from that part. I've told now, I don't have to hold it anymore. Yeah. So that was wonderful. So Christopher provided that safety. Another way, reason that would, they would come out is if I was in absolute danger. And the part that was created to handle that kind of threat whether it was sexual abuse or physical abuse or verbal abuse or whatever it was, then um, they, would, they would feel um, that they have to come and protect me. Yeah, so they'd be triggered out. They would be triggered out, right. yes. Okay. So if you hadn't gone into therapy, do you think, you, you may ne is it possible you may never have known 
that you had these alters? That, that was what was actually going on inside you? or I think if I hadn't gone into therapy, the voices would have got louder. I would have got more suicidal. And I probably... I can't say this for sure. I think I would have taken my life. It was getting unbearable. And it would have got worse. I would have got more and more dysfunctional. Because as it was, I had trouble maintaining an ordinary lifestyle. Uh, I was I was cutting myself and not knowing why am I why am I'd wake up why am I cut where did that come from where did the scabs come from um, and as I you see if you expose yourself to triggers and I was looking after people who had been abused and of course if I had come back to England as I as I did eventually but without working through some of that stuff, all sorts of things would have triggered me. Yeah. You know, the voice of certain people, certain trees, certain places. Uh, it would have been a nightmare. I, I certainly, I don't think, could have functioned as a, a wife and a mother. I, certainly, I would have ended up in a mental health institution, almost for certain, um, possibly not being able to handle life. So uh, that helped me enormously to be able to have the permission to relax and let out what was in. Now, when I started to remember things and the alters started to calm, the, by alters I mean other parts, other personalities, mm -hmm. they were telling their story, they were releasing the pressure. Um, and it got chaotic and crazy, but at least what was being held inside was coming out. Yeah. And it was like, wow, is this what I'm going through? No wonder I feel a bit crazy inside. Yeah. I'm, perhaps I'm not crazy after, after all. Perhaps I'm just hurting. Mm -hmm. Perhaps I have reason to feel the way I feel, which is very validating. Yeah. Even though <clears throat> at that time, hardly anybody know, knew what was going on and they certainly didn't understand DID. But, you know, I, I knew that I trusted Christopher. And he's a well-known, established, first-rate psychotherapist. He was a psychologist and a doctor. And, and because I trusted him, and this is what he was saying, mm -hmm. I thought, he can't be totally wrong, can he? Yeah. So, so having that person developing that trust relationship was obviously absolutely key for you to, feeling, to feel safe enough yeah. to express and, and release your trauma. And outside of the therapy room with Christopher, what else and who else were providing a safe space for you? Hmm. That's an interesting one. And I think it's something that's really on my heart when I help others. Because for most people, when they close the door of the therapist room, you go out into an unsafe world. And suddenly, who do you talk to? What do you do when you fall apart? And that was a real problem until the time came when a church came and picked me up, really, and befriended me. And I had all kinds of loving people helping me. Because at, at that point, my children and, and husband had returned to England and I was in America. I was illegal, I was homeless, I was penniless. I didn't have much to eat. And it was all got pretty hairy for a while. So did you stay to do your therapy? It was that yeah. Your, yeah, that was your reason for staying? It's the only yeah. reason I stayed, and I thought it would be a couple of weeks, maybe a couple of months, and I'd go back to England and join the family. Yeah. And it was three and a half years before I saw them. And, um, and I had nothing at all. Uh, and of course, in, in America, you don't have, the social services don't come and pick you up and help you. So food and clothing and, and the basics of life were hard won by. And I, I, I used to make sure I got one good meal a week and the rest were bits and pieces until, <clears throat> excuse me, until these wonderful people came along. And, and God answered prayers, quite frankly, uh, in ma amazing ways. And eventually I was very well cared for and looked after and had a car and all sorts of things. And, and uh, I was loved. And it's the fact that I was loved by other people mm -hmm. 
whatever I did, whether I became a child, they accepted me, or whether I did, you know, weird things. Um, and the drawings I made and the, the, the way I behaved sometimes was very doubtful and very um, dodgy. Yet they recognised that I, I was hurting and I was working through something very, very painful. And they were patient with me and loved me. And it's that love and that support that was every bit as important to me as a therapy. Yeah. So, to, so realising, whilst you're healing on the inside, realising that there were safe people on the outside. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and that everybody wasn't like your abusers and yeah. that trust is possible and that healing is possible. Um, yeah, that reminds me of a, um, a part in your book uh, where you talk about, it's almost like a letter to Satan, where you're sort of saying, um, it's not God that's taking everything away from me. Mm. And you're saying, um, and I'm not going to let you have my spirit. I might have nothing else, but you won't have my spirit. I'm going to fight for that. And so, so you always had that... Um, that courage, really, and that that fight, you held on to that, and I'm sure it must have been so difficult. I know it was from reading the book at times, where you just felt ready to let go and you had yeah. enough. It's a fight. It really is. It's a fight against good and evil, about yeah. God and Satan. Satan wanted me. He thought he had me. He'd made a mistake, because he didn't. Um, and he wasn't going to give up without a fight. And yet, once I decided... I'd have to make that decision. In fact, I have to make that decision all the way along. Whose side am I on? Am I going to give in? Mm. Or am I going to stand up for what I know is good and from God and is pure and lovely and beautiful? And is you. Is you. Yeah. Is really who you really are. Not yes. not, not all this other no. confusion. No. And, you know, and, and, and sort of... Um, safety altars that you had to create but actually the core you the real you the spirit of who you actually are yes well the altars were me as well yeah. but there were me that a parts of me that had to play these roles yeah. in order to keep me alive yeah and but survival just staying alive is not what life's all about there's a whole lot more than just staying alive and I know that, you know, my reading of the Bible said that Jesus came that we might have life and have it to the full. And I was thinking, this is not life to the full. This is survival. There's more than this. And I want more than this. And I demand more than this. And I'm going to I'm going to go for it. And you're going to look for it. Yeah. You, and you also said, and I think this is really, really important um, in that same paragraph where you're talking about not letting go of your yourself and your spirit not giving oh giving up you talk about and I'm not going to feel sorry for myself and I'm not going to get go into a pity party and I think that when people have been through terrible um, trauma to empathize with yourself and to it is key and it's really important to healing but pitying yourself is a different thing isn't it and getting into that sort of state of mind is very disempowering well when you're an abused child you're really taught to be the victim you're under everybody else's control you have no power of yourself you have to do what i tell you to do or else this is what will happen and so you learn to be helpless. And that learned helplessness stays with you. The way you get through is to be a helpless person. And I, I learned that very well. I was very good at being helpless. I need you. I need you. I, you know, I can't do this by myself. I need you. Um, but after a while, you realise that there's nothing, there's no sense of self. Mm -hmm. uh, everything I do and say and feel and think, I have to make sure that it's what other people want me to do and say and think. And it's like, but, yeah, but that isn't, that isn't living. That isn't having that sense of personhood that God gave each of us uniquely. Yeah. And, um, and I think what, what I want to be able to do in the work I do is to help people realise that they are them. Other people can help them, but there's stuff only they can do. Mm -hmm. And I say to people who are in recovery, 
Oh, you alone can do it, but you can't do it alone. Yeah. You can do this. And I thought, I can do this, but I, I'm going to need some help. But actually, they can't do it for me. I've got to do it. Only I can do what only I can do. And taking that pity away is a shame because it, it feels like that's a nice warm blanket I can wear. It's nice to feel mm. sorry for yourself. Yeah. yeah. You know, poor old me. You know, you don't know what I've gone through. No, they don't. Yeah. They haven't gone through that. No, they haven't. You'll never know what pain. No, they won't ever know. But so what? That's not just feeling sorry for myself. It's not going to make me better. Yeah, yeah I, that that I, another part of the book. Did your therapist start just saying to you, "So what"? When you would say things, "So what"? When I came back, yeah. At, when I was back in England, you know, and I I saw things and felt things and remembered things. I'd ring Steve, uh, uh, my mentor and, and and great help over here, and he would, and I would say, "I've just remembered something." And it's awful, Steve, it's awful. And this is what happened. And, and he'd say, so? So what? Does it, does it alter who you are today? No. Yeah. Does it change who you are? No. So what? That happened then, yeah, that's nasty, it's horrible. It should not have happened. That was awful. But don't forget, this is who you are now. Yeah. You're not a helpless victim now. For me, I'm, I'm a child of God. I am wanted and loved and chosen, and that's who I am. Not this pathetic little worm of a person that I really believed I was. That you never actually really were. It's an identity that's, you take on. That's survive, an identity you take on. Yeah. In fact, what, what you come away with when you're a child and you've been abused, you come away with the message that you're only good for what use you can be to us. Mm, yeah. That's so. that's the only good you are. You're here because you're useful to us. You actually make us feel powerful. You make us feel strong. You you know you're a, a laughing stock or whatever it is, and that's all. Um, but otherwise, you're just dirty, which is what I believed. I was dirty. Dirty things happened to me. Therefore, I must be dirty, and that's a lie. Yes, yeah. an absolute lie. Yeah. And once I began to realise that I'd been believing lies all my life. Oh, darn it. You know, I'd better make some changes. Yeah. I want to believe the truth. Yeah. And the beauty of it is that you can. And, you and can, can make the changes, you can decide what you believe. Yes, you can. Yeah, and then you can live by it. But sometimes you need a bit of help. Yeah. In fact, sometimes when you're a survivor of ritual abuse like this, you need a lot of help. Yeah. You need people cheering you on. You can do this. It's a hero's journey, mm. isn't it? It's the hero's journey, you, really. You just have to have those people, you know, rooting for you yeah. and reminding you again and again and again. It wasn't your fault. You're not bad. Bad things happened. You're not bad. You didn't choose this. And look, you're survived. You've, you've, you're here. You're sitting here now. Wow, isn't that amazing? You're just great. And I love to say to survivors, well done, you. Look what you've got through. You've done that. You've got this far. You could go the whole hog. It's, it's an amazing, you know, that you are sitting here today, that you are the person you are, and having survived what you, what you have survived, it really does show your spirit. And, you know, very strongly, it, it's a real commendation to you. And I think, you know... When soldiers go to war and they come back, they get medals and they get accolades yeah. for the fight they fought. Your, fought. your fight started when you were just a tiny little girl. Mm. Your battlefield was your childhood. And, you know, people that get through this kind of trauma and who don't become perpetrators themselves, they get through it, they don't allow it to crush them, destroy them, twist them mm. that's that's a heroic that's a heroic spirit that's a heroic person that's done that and got through that but i also think there are heroes who stick with people like me yeah who yeah. who stick around and they're not put off with weird things or you see hurt people hurt people 
And when you're hurting inside, you sometimes will lash out against other people. Anger is misplaced quite often. Mm -hmm. And I haven't always been nice, but people have stuck around. Yeah. Uh, I've been an absolute nuisance because when you're desperate for love and attention, when you're desperate for affirmation, um, you might, you go on and on a bit. You know, and when I, I'll ring somebody and I'll say, am I okay? They'll say for the umpteenth time, yes, Caroline, you're okay. You're more than okay. And in fact, after I'd integrated the, the other parts, I kept ringing up somebody um, who, who, who was such a help to me. And I was always ringing saying, am I all right, Steve? Am I all right? Am I doing all right? He'd say, yes, Carolyn. Yeah. Mm. And he didn't mind at first how many times I needed reminding. I just needed somebody to tell me I'm an okay person. It's okay to be me. It's the validation. Yeah. yeah it's okay to be me. That's that's the thing. Because yeah. that, that is what they make you feel like, isn't it? On every single level, it's yeah. not okay to be you. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's getting that ownership of the person you are, taking that ownership mm. back and saying, actually, mm. it's more than okay to be me. It's great to be me, actually. Mm. Yeah. You know, it's sort of... Uh, and I'm glad that I'm me. Yeah. I'm, and even though I'm just a little squirt, I'm only four foot nine... And, and that was because I didn't thrive as a child. Yeah. My twin sister is taller than me. And, you know, um, I certainly, all the way through my childhood and well into adulthood, I was, I was laughed at and everything else for being so small. And, and it's been a struggle. Um, this is who I am. Mm. And I, I must not be ashamed of that. It's, it's my marks of, you know, my, my battle wounds, if you like, mm -hmm. that I didn't thrive as a little child. I... I I probably didn't have enough to eat. I certainly didn't have all the affirmation and, and all the other things that I needed in order to, to, to live healthily. Yeah. Um, but this is who I am. This is who God made me. This is what I am today. And, and I'm glad to be who I am today. Yeah, I'm, I'm a fairly happy bunny. So, so <laughs> get going back a little bit um, to your journey... Um, you, I mean, your book, your book, Am I a Good Girl Yet, yeah, really yeah. does, um, over here, really does um, go into a lot of detail. It's, it's a brilliantly written book. It's very touching. It's not for the faint-hearted. Mm -mm. It's, it, it's an incredible book, and I think it's something that I, I think really should be read by so many people. It, it gives such great insight and hope, actually, and it, um, it, to so many people, potentially. It's an amazing book. Um, you talk about your your integration yes. of the different parts, um, the different altars, and something that was, was interesting and, and struck me was where you said that some of the parts you identified as demons. Yes. So, and, and I thought that that would be an interesting um, thing to talk about, um, especially with regard to you saying that you felt inherently evil and inherently, you know, there's something really wrong with you, you're a bad person and you're going to taint people and, yes. and things. How did you, with the, the altars that you felt were demonic, how did you identify those or differentiate between those and the angry, maybe angry protective altars that you had? Yeah, that, that's a difficult one because I didn't easily do that and, and I didn't want to acknowledge that there was something that evil inside of me. Um, the way I would say it is that um, altars, even the ones that appear to be angry and um, mouthy and aggressive, they will respond to love, just as any hurt child will respond to love. Something demonic, well, the only response to love would be to hate even more. Okay. And and and. And actually, to scare them off, because right. uh, the demonic uh, demons and love do not mix. 
and say they would expose themselves and they will. Okay. And I would say if anyone is worried about is this an altar or is this a demon, I would say just not worry about it. Just don't. Because if there's darkness in, in you in any kind of way, what do you do when you walk into a dark room? You don't shout at the darkness. You turn the light on. So if there's darkness and anything demonic going on in somebody's life, well, then you just pour on the light. All that is good, all that is from God, all that is beautiful. You pour that in. Mm. Affirmation and love and forgiveness and, and good things and laughter and creativity and all, the, all that's good in life. Pour that in. And the acceptance and all that stuff. And very soon... Anything demonic will show themselves up or get the hell out of there because yeah. they won't like it at it's all. It's not a comfortable home anymore. It won't be comfortable. Yeah. No. And so I, I think the best way of dealing with it, and I know there are churches, and absolutely right, there are times when it's right to do this, where you'll go into a church and, and they'll want to cast something out. But for me... That is absolutely the last resort. Mm. And in all the years now that I've been working with people with DID, um, they have never, I've never had cause or reason to do any deliverance with them. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. I, think, I think, obviously, you're a Christian, committed Christian, and I think uh, people... Um, watching the video some some of them may not have a faith yes and they may feel that there's something wrong with them that they've got something dark inside them i think i think that's quite common for people who yeah. who've certainly gone through abuse it's very common yeah, isn't it absolutely um, and i do wonder what maybe they would they would word it differently or perceive it differently and think that perhaps they produced an altar that hadn't got um conscience or was kind of um, um, lacked empathy and lacked connection to any kind of emotional mm. body like you know complete mm. disconnect from the heart you know but however you look at it it doesn't change what you just said mm. and that is the more you learn to trust the more you learn to accept love from other people uh, the more you let the light in, yes, in in every way that you can, whether it's connecting <coughs> with nature, mm. people, music, yourself, yes. um, just doing things that you love. The more you do that, the more healing yes. is going to happen. Look for goodness. Yes. Look for beauty. Yes. Yeah. Look for it. Yes. I, I think I think the the connection to something greater than self is something that. You hear about so much. Mm. I hear about that so much. And from so many different... There's so many different ways of looking at that and ways of um, sort of, uh, yeah, describing it. Um, for some people, it's God. For mm. some people, it's the great spirit, maybe. Mm. You know, the universe, the different, different words. And I know that everybody's connection and belief system is absolutely theirs and very very important and the, the reason I'm, I'm I'm sort of bringing this in is because it seems to me um, at least in my experience with the clients that I've worked with and people that I know that to have a connection to something greater than yourself wider you know um, than than yourself or any other human something greater a belief in something bigger, a benevolent spirit is is really, really important and incredibly helpful. Yes, I see I would I would say that the reason therapy alone does not help people is because something like DID, especially or or, or recovery from ritual abuse, satanic ritual abuse particularly, um, isn't the, the, the needs from that aren't addressed by therapy alone because there is a spiritual component to it. And whether we like it or not, I think 
you know, modern science has to agree there is a spiritual aspect to, to our lives and we have to address it. And if you ignore that part, you're not going to be completely whole. Because when you're exposed to that level of evil, whether it's in a cult or a coven or something religious or not, then something bad is part of what's going wrong in your life. Mm -hmm. And you have to drown it out. You have to get the balance so that instead of the evil being the heavier one, good is the heavier one. Mm -hmm. And you, how are you going to do that? Now, in my book, for me and for the people that I work with, it's finding that Jesus Christ is the one that has conquered death. That's, that's the, the world that I live in. Um, and I'm finding that even though people who've often been in therapy a long time, when Heart for Truth organization I lead, when we go in and we help them recognize that actually you can be free by stepping into the life of God in him, whatever that means for, for other people, then you exchange your pitiful, self-pitying victim mentality mm -hmm. for, I am somebody who's been chosen and somebody who's been loved and somebody who is stronger because I'm holding God's hand. And that is hugely enabling, hugely, and makes all the difference. And we're see seeing many, many people around the country now becoming whole because, you know, they're not what they thought they were. Yeah. And they're what they were told they were. And they're not what they told they were, mm. yeah. That is so cool. So cool. Aha! I love it. So could you, could you tell us a little bit more about Heart for Truth? A little bit more yeah, insight. well, I started to work for an organisation called Freedom in Christ Ministries after I realised that I, I could be free. And uh, I came back to England and in eight months after their support and their saying, Carolyn, you know, you can you could spend a career looking for wholeness. You know, we can make a career of getting well. And I know people <laughs> who do going, you know, you can have the, the tablets here and the support groups and the therapy and all the rest of it. Um, I didn't want that. That's life's much better. There's more to life for me than that. Mm. Um, and, and, and they said, do you know what? Did you know that you can't, you're already free because you, you know Jesus? And I, I thought, mm, OK. Then. But anyway, in eight months, I became free of anything demonic and of all the other parts. They all integrated. They all felt comfortable uh, because they've told their story and they were all comfortable in becoming me and I became whole, I started to work with Freedom in Christ in the conferences and so on. And after a few years, um, the, the organisation said to me, well, why don't you fly? Why don't you start your own organisation, your own ministry? And I did and called it Heart for Truth because I really believe, really believe that we don't have to stay divided and fragmented and broken. We don't have to. No. There are other ways of living. And with that and my, my experience of being loved by God, I was able then to start this organisation. And I, um, I go to churches um, and I have an, an, a whole ministry now that's, that's quite far reaching. And they will ring me up and say, Carolyn, can you help Susie Smith or Joe Bloggs or whoever? Because they've been struggling for years and years and we've been struggling for years and years trying to help them and we don't know what to do. And I'll say, yeah, I can help them, but I'm not going to. You're going to help them. Yes, but we've been trying for years and we don't know what to do. And I said, well, I'll come and show you how. And I'll go and spend a few hours or a day um, talking to them about how ordinary people can surround them with the kind of acceptance and intelligent loving that will help them understand themselves, help the other parts inside of them, if, if they have that, um, realise that they don't have to hold on to those secrets because they're now safe. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to hurt them anymore. 
And once they've let go of that, within that embrace of good, safe people, over months, sometimes even years, within that kind of shelter of safety, they become well and whole. And people who've been in the mental health system for years, sometimes within months, of recognising that they've got safe people around them. Yeah, that's so key. They can let go. Yeah. I want to tell you this. And they might act out and all that stuff to let go of all that rubbish. Yeah. And when they've let it all go, they realise they can live a new life. They can really be themselves, not have to make excuses for who they are or pretend what, to be what they're not. And it's a beautiful thing to see. Yeah. And actually, even the people that help them are changed because there's a love and a bonding that you get when you're helping somebody. Yes, there this is. This is just beautiful. Yeah, the walls go down, don't they? they? Do. Any walls, and everyone has some walls, yeah. don't they? And we can all become vulnerable. And I say, yeah. and people say, yeah, but I'm not, fr I'm not free either. I'm, I've got struggles. And I say, oh, jolly good, we'll all struggle together. Yeah. That's all right. It's you know, humanity comes yes. together, isn't it? If you're broken and I'm broken, let's hold hands and be broken together. And then, then we can help each other up. Let's do it together. Yeah, and it works. It works. So, so you you've got a new book coming out, Intelligent Loving. Hopefully, yes. Yes. Um, and so, could you just because that leads perfectly on to talking a little bit about your new book, yeah. if that's okay, uh, and what that's about and who that's aimed at. Well, it, I suppose it's aimed primarily at the people I already work with, and that's primarily churches. Christian organisations, healing centres, counselling centres, those kinds of folks, because they're the ideal place of getting a group of people who choose to work together and, and, and are, are linked with some, something, a strong bond. And basically it is that, it's having this little group of people. Traditionally, um, when we want to help somebody, they're in the middle of the, the picture and yeah. you have the people around them and we'll do them good and we'll make them apple pies and we'll be kind to them and, and that sort of thing. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. that. That's fine. But actually, the person in the middle feels uncomfortable, yeah. um, intimidated, overwhelmed, maybe. overwhelmed yeah. threatened, yeah. expectations, I've mm. got to suddenly get better or else I've got to stay unwell, I've got to stay odd, otherwise they'll all go away if I suddenly start getting well. And that's horrible. But So instead of keeping them in the middle, let's take them out of the middle and put them as part of the circle. Then they're part of a circle yeah. of close friends and they've got a role and a place, they're trusted. They're not this poor little person who we've got to you know, pull our sleeves up and do them some good. We're actually taking them seriously. They're my friend, and and she's mine. And mutually respectful. Equal. Mutually re mutual re respect is yeah. so important. Yeah. Then they begin to start to respect themselves. Yeah. And the way they see themselves is different. The way other people see them is different. Yeah. And though immediately the dynamics change. Then if we really understand a little bit about what's going on for them, what's really, what's really hard for them and they can't cope with nights, and they can't cope with this, and they find that really hard, then we can target our help in intelligent for times, ways yeah. for those times. Yeah. But we don't, you know, we don't all rush in at the same time. Somebody will be good at phone calls and somebody else will be good at cooking the meals. And so we can actually together, over the long haul, walk them into freedom. Fantastic. And uh, we have truth teams now all over the world. And... Um, it, it is transferable into any culture yes. and into any situation. situation yeah. Yeah. It just it takes a bit of organisation and it takes give and take. And we've got all got to be prepared to be vulnerable yeah. and say, well, I'm helping you, but actually, you know, I'm messed up too. Perhaps yeah. you can help me. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It is that honesty, isn't it? And that, that, that uh, transparency between people. But and we the trust need, that you have we to need have. the safety. You've got to yeah. be trustworthy. Yeah. You've got to be prepared to be honest about yourself as well if yeah. you want to help others. Yes, definitely. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, is there anything else that you did? I think I came across uh, something in your book about artwork. You did some artwork to 
did you outpicture your trauma through art or did you heal I, through your artwork? Uh, well, I, I, you'll, in the book, the pictures in the book, if you've got a, a copy with pictures in. Mine didn't have pictures. You didn't have pictures no, in your copy. I'll pictures. let you have a copy <laughs> with pictures in. Right. You'll see that I've got... Uh, uh, Alters had different handwriting. Okay. And they drew, each had their own style of drawing. And so some of them were quite good at drawing. I'm not, but some of my other parts were. So they okay. drew, others just coloured in butterflies and what have you. But they were able to um, express themselves. Right, that's huge. On isn't paper. It yeah. is absolutely huge. Yeah. And certainly if you're working through abuse with children or with people with child parts, which yes. is the same the same um, essentially technique yeah. then having words for things is is not something that you can do quite often yeah. even as an adult you can't find words to ex explain what's been happening yeah. so to be able to scribble very dark charcoal on a piece of paper that says something mm -hmm. or if you're able to actually draw what happened or what you want to happen, or what's going on inside you, that's really hugely helpful. Yeah. And so that's a very good way of beginning to explore what's happening inside. Because inside of all of us, we have this amazing world of beauty and creativity. And everything is different in my world than it is in yours yeah. and everyone else's. Yeah. So let's, let's give some, somebody else something that's from me deep down and it's a great gift we give each other mm, it is yeah beautiful yeah. Actually. yes so and and also um some of the some of the abuse happens when you're pre-verbal yes so that is probably the only way that it can be channeled is through mm. through uh, and you are ac accessing a different part of the brain when you're drawing aren't you to, to when you're talking i think and yes so you're kind of getting into different places <clears throat> well yes when you're in survival mode, so it's the adrenaline is running and the cortisol is, 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 is going and, and you've got to keep um, alive. So you're looking out for signs of danger and you're in survival mode. You're working from the back part of, some people call it the, the reptilian brain, mm -hmm. but it's the very basic survival part of your brain. Um, and that's all it is, survival. But I don't think we were meant to live in that bit. Yeah. We're meant to live in the, the frontal co cortex just here, which there's, that releases uh, the feel-good hormones. Yeah. And it releases, um, is triggered with joy and beauty and creativity and, and worship and all that is good. Now, I want to live all the time there. It's more fun there, isn't it? Oh, it's really? absolutely more, more fun. fun. Yeah. There's chocolate cake in that bit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay, um, you say in your book, you say something I thought was really, really important, and that was um, you're talking about DID. Yes. And you say that to some extent we're all fragmented, we're, we're, we're all looking for wholeness. Um, you don't have to have a diagnosis of DID to be looking for wholeness um, or to have suffered trauma. Everybody does suffer trauma on some level, don't they, in their life, a longer sort of continuum. And so wholeness is something that everybody really is searching for. Um, is there anything, is there any sort of um, mantra or something that really kept you going on your journey? Something that really stands out for you or, you know, sort of yeah, any, mm. anything that you sort of said to yourself when you were really struggling to keep you, to keep you mm. going? Well, I, I certainly know from years of experience of both being a survivor and working with survivors is that everyone is looking for security and significance and acceptance. And, and that's just a given. We, we want to feel that we're important, that we've got a role, that we're loved, that we're accepted, that we've, um, that, you know, we're secure in who we are. Um, and certainly that is very, very raw for survivors and you're desperate. But actually for everybody, 
it's awful to feel that you're not loved. I mean, and I know for, as a therapist, I know, and, and you'll probably bear this out, that the bottom line is rejection is the most painful thing. And almost everybody that I've ever seen in the therapy room has suffered in some form of rejection. And it's devastating, absolutely devastating. And certainly abuse is a very graphic form of rejection. Yes, yes, yeah. And so um, we're all looking for that acceptance. Now, for me, and, and there's, there's, there's no other answer, I have to say, that for me, knowing God in Jesus was the only thing, much of the time, that kept me going. Right. That I was loved by God. Yeah. So if everybody else disappeared off the scene and there was only me, I would still be loved. And I needed to know I was loved. And love <clears throat> is a very, very firm and stable place in which to build your life. And powerful. And powerful. And if you mm. don't find that, then you really are up the creek without a paddle. But nobody has to be that. No. Because if you look, this is a wonderful world that we live in, in spite of various politicians <laughs> um, and other things that might mm. make us feel other otherwise. You don't have to look very far to find love. No, you don't. That's very true. Thank you very much, Carolyn. Thank you. I really appreciate you spending your time with us. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you.